Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual panel discussion led by George William Van Cleve, author of Making a New American Constitution and the Question of Constitutional Reform. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Tuesday, April 6th at noon, Jonathan Petropoulos will tell us about his new book, Gehring's Man in Paris, the story of Bruno Losa, who helped supervise the Nazi's systematic theft of thousands of artworks during World War II. And on Tuesday, April 13th at 6 p.m., Lisa Napoli, author of Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR, we lead a discussion of the early years of National Public Radio with three of the trailblazing women of the title, Susan Stamberg, Linda Wertheimer, and Nina Totenberg. I'm speaking to you from the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., where the rotunda of our museum has displayed the United States Constitution for nearly 70 years. The Constitution, along with the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, is a centerpiece of our exhibit space, where in a normal year, about a million visitors come to see the founding documents of our nation. We haven't had visitors in a long while, but the three charters remain safely stored, preserved for many generations. Another founding document is seldom displayed, the Articles of Confederation. Our current constitution came about after leading citizens of the states concluded the articles needed to be replaced with a stronger federal government. In making a new American constitution, Author George William Van Cleve proposes that a new constitutional convention may be in order. Today, our three panelists will probe the described flaws in the Constitution and debate how to create a new social contract. George William Van Cleve received his J.D. cum laude from Harvard Law School and his Ph.D. from the University of Virginia. He was an attorney for 25 years with private law firms and in the federal government and represented private and government clients in state and federal courts from Massachusetts to California. He has taught at four law schools and the University of Virginia, was a research professor in law and history at Seattle University of School of Law, and is now Dean's Visiting Scholar at Georgetown University Law Center. In addition to making a new American constitution, he is the author of A Slaveholders Union, Slavery Politics in the Constitution in the Early American Republic, and we have not a government, the Articles of Confederation and the Road to the Constitution. He's published numerous law and history journal articles on British and American constitutional, legal, and political history. Joining us as panelists today are Julian Maxwell Hayter, Associate Professor of Leadership Studies at the University of Richmond's Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and David S. Tannenhaus, Professor of History at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and James E. Rogers, Professor of History and Law at the William S. Boyd School of Law, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Now let's hear from the panel. Thank you for joining us today. I'm George Van Cleve, author of Making a New American Constitution. I'd like to welcome our viewers and thank you for joining us for this discussion of constitutional reform. I'd like to thank the uh, archivist David Pierre for <coughs> allowing us to present this discussion today and to thank Douglas Swanson from the archives for his considerable help in making the arrangements for this broadcast. <coughs> Finally, I'd like to thank today's panelists, <coughs> uh, professors Julian Hader and David Tannenhaus for their participation in today's discussion. Before we begin, I want to emphasize that the archives bears no responsibility for any part of our discussion today. Now, the issue of constitutional reform has two parts. First, are constitutional changes deserved? And second, if they are, what is the best way to achieve them? I'm going to begin with a brief summary of my views on these issues, which are discussed in my book. And then we'll hear from Professors Hayden and Tannenhaus uh, with their own views. <clears throat> As to whether reform is desirable, I argue that we need to make fundamental changes to the Constitution. The 
The Constitution has many desirable features, such as its Bill of Rights and its commitment to equal justice and the rule of law. And it has been amended over the years to broaden the suffrage in important ways and to nationalize many important rights. Though sometimes key changes have occurred only at the point of a gun, as they did as a result of our civil war. But today, the Constitution really doesn't meet either the Founders' goals or modern needs. Why doesn't it meet the Founders' goals? The Founders believed that they were creating an egalitarian republic. That's what the Declaration of Independence says. But today, American society is highly unequal, both economically and politically, and we do not have a truly Republican government, especially by modern standards. In America today, wealth is highly concentrated, and social mobility has declined sharply over the past several decades. Our middle class, whose continued existence is critical to the survival of democracy, is collapsing. Beyond extreme wealth disparities that especially harm the lives of people of color, there are also persistent racial inequalities in major institutions, such as the criminal justice system and education. Great wealth inequality also means great political inequality. Careful studies have shown that public policies often reflect the desires of the wealthy not those of the general public. Clearly, to preserve our democracy, we need substantial economic and social reforms to restore the middle class and to make racial equality and impartial justice realities. Unfortunately, the Constitution is now a major obstacle to such reforms. There are several important reasons why. The first reason is that the Constitution and Supreme Court interpretations of it protect great concentrated wealth and power. The Constitution today gives grossly disproportionate political power to small states, and many of their representatives think that protecting existing wealth is central to their jobs. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution to allow enormous wealth to be used to influence the political process as I detail in my book. In the future, the Supreme Court may also interpret the Constitution to limit Congress's power to control excessive wealth. So the Constitution and its interpretation unfairly protect a wealthy class that opposes important social and economic reforms. A second reason that the Constitution is the enemy of reform is that the Constitution is not truly Republican, because it allows popular minorities to control important government decisions. I expect that my colleagues are going to discuss representation issues in some detail a little later. In the interest of time, let me just say now that my book shows, for example, that the Senate's extreme small state bias repeatedly distorts major national policy choices on issues from climate change to foreign policy to gun control. The third reason that the Constitution is failing us is that key parts of it, such as the separation of powers, no longer work. Congress is no longer our central policy-making body, as the founders not only expected but feared that it would be. It is chronically gridlocked, and it has ceded authority, uh, much of its authority, to presidents under the Supreme Court who have, as a result, too much political power. Republican government is growing steadily weaker as a result. Now, many people today of differing political views support individual constitutional amendments, such as limiting or barring money in politics or a balanced budget amendment. But my book shows that none of these individual reforms will succeed. And there are a variety of reasons for that, but it's clear that it simply is not going to happen. And I quoted an entire chapter. 
nor will popular end runs, such as the National Popular Vote Initiative, succeed. This means that a popular convention is the only viable route to reform. Now, many people fear any new constitutional convention. Later, I expect that my colleagues will discuss some of the understandable concerns about holding the convention. In my view, however, there is no sound reason to fear a convention. Conventions have no authority whatsoever unless and until their work is ratified by a popular supermajority. Therefore, a convention can only succeed in making changes regarded as legitimate if its work accurately reflects the views of a popular supermajority. This means there is little chance that a convention will adopt extreme proposals because if it does, they will be rejected, as the founders were acutely aware. And a convention is the only place where it will be possible to make a grand bargain to resolve a range of hotly contested issues. A new convention will allow us to begin the essential process of restoring national unity. And with that, let's turn to the panel for their views on these issues. And to start, I want to ask both panelists, do you think that major constitutional reforms are needed? Why or why not? If you think they are, what general types of reforms do you support and why? But you, you all would uh, like to make brief opening statements before we get to those questions. Feel free. David? Yes, well, uh, thank you so much, George, and the National Archives for arranging this conversation. Let me start by saying last spring, I had the students in my constitutional history course at UNLV write a performance review of the U.S. Constitution for President Trump. They had to answer three questions. Why did we adopt it in the first place? How well has it worked? And do we still need it? Among the course materials, they read George's book on the kind of story of how we got from the Articles of Confederation to our current constitution. And then uh, George was generous enough to share drafts of the chapters from uh, his new book, Making a New American Constitution. I want to say with few exceptions, the students absolutely believed that we still needed the uh, United States Constitution because it preserves the rule of law and protects us against tyranny. Yet, they were worried about the future and whether uh, we're capable of meeting the challenges of the 21st century. They wanted to reform the Constitution, uh, but only through amending it. Um, the hardest part for them was coming to terms with George's very powerful argument in chapter five of his book that this kind of piecemeal approach will not work. So let me just uh, conclude with uh, two uh, observations. At first, at my core, I'm a lowercase Republican. I believe in representative and inclusive democracy, a free market for the exchange of ideas, regulated property rights, and majoritarian rule. I support universal suffrage for all adult citizens. That includes uh, prisoners and ex-prisoner voting rights. So I believe uh, very deeply um, in uh, democratic uh, participation. I believe, to get to George's question, we need major constitutional reform because the Constitution itself generates anti-democratic governance and it prevents us from using national power to meet the challenges of the 21st century, uh, which include climate change, growing income and wealth inequality, bitter political polarization, massive over-incarceration of our citizens, and a troubling loss of faith in democracy as a viable system of government. So I'm concerned about uh, where we are now and what the future may bring. Okay, thank you very much, David. And now we'll hear from Julian with some opening remarks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I might take a little bit more time. Uh, you know, I'm a historian, which means I'm in the business of old evidence and discovering new things about old matters. And I suppose it's difficult to reconcile that which hasn't been recognized. You know, and I'm going to lay out some evidence here that I think speaks to the fact that something needs uh, to be uh, reconsidered. You know, in terms of constitutional reform, 
probably is no more pressing issue than malapportioned representation in the Senate, more specifically Article 1, Section 3, and the manner in which state legislatures use statistical formulas to determine the districts that elect members are members to the House of Representatives. You know, I'm not a historian of the Constitution, but I am an urban historian and a historian of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which by default uh, means that I'm flirting with constitutional studies. And in thinking about the question of constitutional reform, um, I, I think perhaps uh, uh, something needs to be reconsidered. And here's what I found, and I think history really does matter here. In terms of the possibility of constitutional reform, there are no more pressing issues than malreports and representation in the Senate, uh, specifically Article 1, Section 3, and the manner in which deeply partisan state legislatures use statistical formulas to determine congressional districts. Both of these problems, it turns out, have historical implications in urban and African-American history. The problem of the Senate, and to a certain degree, the House, relates to the former. The latter, of course, is a matter of America's tortured racial political history, the legacy of disenfranchisement, and the enduring resistance to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 has characterized the last several decades. But let's start with the problem of political cartography. Over the last several decades, the United States has undergone profound demographic shifts. We're not merely more urban than rural, but the continuity of residential segregation in the United States has given rise to shockingly predictable metropolitan housing patterns. Housing patterns that have been manipulated into tortured congressional district lines. There's absolutely no way the framers could have anticipated massive human migrations that characterize residential patterns in the late 19th century and the 20th century. First from farm to city, then city to suburbs. You know, very few people know this, by the way. Um, if you, the movement of Americans into America's suburbs in the mid 20th century was one of the greatest migrations of human beings in the history of humanity, by the way. It, it was unbelievably profound. They also could have not, the framers also could not have not predicted the rise of the megalopolis in increasingly comp complex and dense modern cities. You know, let me just dump some data here, right? In 1790, the urban population of the United States stood at 5.1%. New York was 13%, Virginia 1%, Massachusetts 13 and Pennsylvania 10%. As America's urban population eclipsed rural population, uh, for the first time, America's urban population eclipsed its rural population in 1920. By 1960, 69% of the population lived in cities, 1980, 73%, 2000, 79%, and by 2020, 82%. Over 30 million people live in America's cities. Voting weights and equal representation has become a particularly troublesome matter. You know, political scientist John Griffin argues that if judged by the standard of one person, one vote, the United States is amongst the most malapportioned legislatures in the world, right? The Atlantic actually just brought this up recently. And, and, they, and, they, and by the way, they, they, they brought up Senator Dave, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who argued in 1995 that sometime in the next century, the United States is going to have to address the question of apportionment in the Senate. And in terms of the Senate, the voting power of a citizen of Wyoming, the smallest state in terms of population, is about 67 times that of a citizen in the largest state, which is California. You know, and I'm not implying that real Americans shouldn't have a proportional vote in Washington. I'm saying that the current system did disadvantages any number of demographics in America's urban enclaves, um, and it might even disadvantage people of particular political persuasions. A state's population that influences the relationships between elected officials and voters. It affects fundraising, it affects political behavior, most ominously, public service deliverables and policy decisions. Less populous states consistently receive more federal funding than states with more people. And in terms of the House, Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution led it to state legislatures to draw congressional district boundaries. These matters are more deeply partisan, racial, and contentious by the day. You know, African Americans, in terms of their population numbers, have always exerted a disproportionate influence on American political imagination. From the Three-Fifths Clause to the 15th Amendment to the anti-democratic and under-representation that characterized Jim Crow segregation. Um, and more frankly, black Americans weren't citizens in the United States until 1965, especially in the South. You know, I'll save you the gory details about what that means in terms of public policy and public services, right? But suffice it to say that after the ratification of uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Warren and Burger courts had had enough of the Machiavellian frenzy of not just direct disenfranchisement, but also the, the rise of vote dilution. 
After 1965, they absolutely revolutionized political representation in America. And I'll show you how this matters. It had deeply for, profound implications for the House of Representatives. To beat back the resistance to the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court initiated what we call the so-called reinforcement revolution in a series of cases that I'll spare you the gory details. This went beyond safeguarding access to the suffrage. It also protected a minority group's right to elect preferred representatives in a manner that was commiserate with their total voting age population. They mandated what became known as safe minority districts, where African Americans and ultimately other minorities were free to elect candidates of their choice, free from white interference. This was, of course, chock full of problems. And it had unintended consequences. In time, the legacy of residential segregation not only gave rise to safe black districts, but to safe white districts as well. This led in time to shockingly predictable electoral outcomes. Liberals from diverse cities, moderates from entering suburbs, conservatives from suburbs, and sometimes reactionaries from rural areas. Think about what I just said in terms of Senate, <laughs> Senate representation. All right, now imagine that these very districts, despite various legal reforms since the 1970s, have given rise to overwhelmingly white representation in state legislatures. This has, in recent years, deeply partisan implications. These, right, these partisans have not only continued to draw increasingly tortured districts to protect themselves and their compatriots, these districts have congressional implications. One could make the argument that partisan gridlock in Washington is as much a reflection of residential patterns, malapportionment, and the structure of elections as ideology. Thanks. Julian, thank you very much. Uh, David, uh, would you like to add something about specific reforms that are of concern to you? Yes. Yeah. No, I'd like to, to build on uh, what Julian just said. So I'm you know, supportive of constitutional amendments that would uh, eliminate the Electoral College, abolish uh, the partisan gerrymandering that it's connected to what uh, Julian just uh, explained. Uh, my concern is I'm not sure that we can achieve those major reforms under our current constitutional system because our constitution is the hardest to amend among the, the constitutions in the world today. If you look at our history, since 1789, there have been more than 11,000 proposed amendments. Only 27 of them have become part of the Constitution. And the last substantive amendment that addresses the electoral uh, politics that Julian uh, mentioned, the 26th Amendment, which gave 18-year-olds the right to vote in federal elections, was ratified more than 50 years ago. Uh, and I'm concerned that uh, we're becoming uh, increasingly anti-democratic, particularly the Senate, which uh, Julian was mentioning, that if you think of the example, and I still find this mind boggling, and it's something that George writes about in the book, that a president who lost the popular vote in 2016 was then able to nominate a Supreme Court justice who was confirmed by the votes of only 51 senators who represented approximately 44% of uh, the U.S. population. That justice now holds a lifetime appointment on our nation's highest court. Um, and I find that uh, deeply anti-democratic and, and really troubling. So that, that's my reaction. I really appreciate what Julian laid out. My concerns are how difficult under our constitutional system it is to address this um, anti-democratic present and a future that I'm concerned is going to get worse. I'll end by saying that experts predict, and this builds on Julian's kind of telling us uh, the story of history and urbanization, that by 2040, about 30% of the U.S. population will control 70 seats in the Senate. And moreover, the equal representation of states in the Senate is hardwired into the final clause of Article 5 in the Constitution. So as a believer in democratic theory, we need to have a system that better allows the will of the majority to be expressed. <clears throat> well, David, thank you for that. And uh, in a way, that uh, moves logically, uh, unless there are other reforms that the two of you would like to discuss, um, that moves logically to the question of how it's going to be possible to achieve reform, particularly on these representation issues. Because to start off with, as David points out, um, in theory, the Senate representation 
cannot be changed without the consent of every state. The Constitution has a really remarkable and I think amazingly anti-democratic provision that says that if 49 states want to change the representation in the Senate, one state can say, no, not working for us, the rest of you should go home. So that a reform that was supported by 90% of the population could be defeated by one state. Um, so this brings the broader question, which is, how can we achieve representation reforms? Why shouldn't we just follow the provisions of the existing Constitution for amendments? David, what do you think? Well, that's my, yeah, and I'll turn it over to Julian in a moment, but that's my enormous uh, concern that it was uh, when I first um, realized when kind of studying kind of constitutional history uh, and these issues, there was a whole kind of outpouring of scholarship by people like Jack Raycove um, and then Sandy Levinson when he wrote our undemocratic uh, constitution really pointed out that there was this disjuncture between the system that we had, the, the, the kind of structures in place and democratic values. And I've been, you know, thinking about this issue uh, ever since. And what strikes me is most Americans were very comfortable when we think about the Constitution and what it means. We often turn to the Bill of Rights. We think about the First Amendment, but we don't talk about these structural issues. And I think, you know, particularly the work of Sandy Levinson is, you know, he's been sounding the clarion call now for a generation. And what I found so powerful about George's book was he systematically in chapter five goes through many things that I, I support as amendments to the Constitution and then shows how uh, they can be blocked by a very small uh, percentage of the American people because of how our representation um, doesn't mirror our, our population. But I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to, to Julian. Julian? Yeah, I think we've, we're at a critical inflection point with how we imagine this, right? Uh, I think we, there's, a set, there's a certain amount of path dependency here, right? Where um, because things have operated for so long in a particular way, even imagining the political will it would take to reverse course seems like a daunting task, right? Um, and I think another thing that we have to consider is many of the problems that I talked about with, with malapportioned districts has gotten worse with algorithmic data, right? Um, with the nature in which people are playing with census data. Um, there is metadata now where political strategists are essentially manipulating district boundaries down the corners and city blocks. It's more sophisticated now than it's ever been. And in that way, I think, people have been reluctant to think intently about how we might reform things in large part because they double down on old strategies. So one of the things I think that we need to strongly consider which is also chock full of its own complexities, is creating independent, nonpartisan state-based boards or commissions to draw district boundaries, right? It might be a possibility. If the Constitution mandates that state legislatures have the authority to draw political districts, they might have the constitutional authority or be given the constitutional authority to allow another organization to do the job. Um, because it's clear, um, given not just the long history, but the recent history, um, that, that partisan actors have, are, are incapable of gerrymandering themselves out of power, right? Okay. <clears throat> Julian, thank you. Um, and I might just uh, add that um, I, I would recommend to the viewers today that if they want to learn more about the problem of gerrymandering, there was a case in the Supreme Court called Rucho versus Common Cause a year or two ago, and it's not too hard to get a copy of the decision where the conservatives on the court and the liberals on the court engaged in a knockdown, drag out fight about what the Constitution had to do with uh, gerrymandering. And uh, for better or for worse, the conservatives won and they announced that the Constitution didn't have anything to do with gerrymandering. But the case <clears throat> contains some great examples of the sophistication that Julian was talking about in terms of the way gerrymandering is being done because it's possible for a political party that loses the popular vote in a state to end up with a substantial majority of the congressional seats in that same state. Right. That's the, and there are great examples uh, in the court case, so I'd, I'd recommend that. 
So let's talk a bit more now about this question, though, of how to achieve reform. Um, we've said that it's very difficult to achieve it under the current Constitution. I advocate a new convention, which I think needs to be a popular convention. But I know that a lot of people, and I said uh, earlier, that a lot of people have reservations about that and concerns about it. And David, this is something I know you've given a lot of thought to, so maybe you'd start us off and talk about what concerns you have or you think others legitimately have about a convention. Julian, you're welcome to join in on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me start with, you know, first I want to stress that, I, that I, I think George makes a compelling argument in the book for why we need a new constitutional convention, and I applaud him for starting this conversation because the kind of premise of his book is that we're heading towards crisis and we're going to have to do this at some point, so we need people systematically thinking about how this might work. But let me uh, share my uh, reservations about imagining what happens if we replace uh, the Constitution of 1787, and again, we're doing this at an event sponsored by the National Archives that showcases the Constitution. I have great reverence for it. It's a wonderful site. You know, I wanted my family to, to see it, my my son. Um, so what, uh, you know, so what happens if we replace it with an entirely new American Constitution? How can we, in this currently divided nation, uh, legitimate a new Constitution? That, that's the, the challenge. And moreover, how do we inculcate civic awareness of the structural framework that contemporary Americans are much more comfortable, as I, I suggested earlier, uh, discussing uh, individual rights. When we launched uh, Constitution Day, uh, the government uh, sent to many universities this bookmark for the Constitution, and it was literally the Bill of Rights. It wasn't uh, the structural part. But why the conversation about the new uh, convention is so important is it forces all of us to uh, discuss what we value about our constitutional heritage. What are those values that we want to see uh, a new constitution uh, champion? That that's why this is, is such an important conversation that we don't want to either engage in the idea of simply kind of worshiping the founders or, um, you know, just trashing the founders as, you know, people who lived in a you know, very different time with different sensibilities. But what can we take uh, from that original constitution? And I would add, for me, our constitutional heritage, uh, it's absolutely essential to come to terms with the vision of uh, the post-Civil War 1860s that, you know, I don't want to talk only about the Constitution of 1787. For me, uh, you have to talk about uh, the 14th Amendment, where we actually, you know, finally wrote in the idea of equality before the law into the document. So for me, as somebody, and, and like Julia, I'm also an historian by training, um, I don't want to lose what I think is so valuable about our heritage, our, our tradition, the values that we'd want to ensure. And I really think the idea of having this conversation forces people um, to come to terms and list what it is they value. George talked about some of those values in the opening. Uh, he has concerns that separation of powers no longer works the way it should. But I think we have to have that discussion about the kind of system we want and, and who we are as, as Americans. And if we don't do this, I'm afraid um, we're, we're losing our, our belief in democracy. And also, if we keep just coming up with workarounds or if we're going to rely on the Supreme Court to give us our answers, um, the Constitution and these values are going to lose legitimacy. It, it, my fear, and I always tell this to students, is I don't ever want to be in a place where we have um, a democratic constitution and a republican constitution, that uh, would be disastrous, that we need some way to have a shared United States constitution. But I'm really interested to hear uh, Julian's thoughts. Yeah, I, I, can I take a slightly, I want to bring up a slightly different set of questions about this discussion, um, if you don't mind. And it, the question is, 
in this hyper politicized environment, how can we have this conversation without people interpreting it or misinterpreting it as anti-American? Right. Um, that, 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 you know, no one's doubting that the Constitution isn't full of wonderful provisions. Right. I mean, the framers is a lot baked into the Constitution. Right. The apparatus that allowed people to look like me, the ability to disestablish the slave system. I mean, it's brilliant in that way. Right? But there's as much myth and saga around the Constitution as, right, as there are actual wonderful provisions. And my question is, we've struggled to come to terms with the, the, the distinctions between America's stated democratic claims and its actual political uh, practices, right? And how do we have a discussion about constitutional reform in a hyper-politicized um, uh, environment where people can't even seem to speak to one another across their political differences, right? So, um, I, if, if it seems okay, I mean, I think yes. you both raise questions um, that I, I probably should try and take a crack at. Um, Julian, let me just start off by saying, uh, for your viewers, for the viewers' benefit, that the history that you were describing, history of urbanization, of demographic change and so on is absolutely fundamental to understanding why the Constitution doesn't work today. Because the framers had no idea that we would end up with a country 100 times as large and almost totally urbanized compared to the country they lived in. And the rules they created didn't anticipate those changes. So they work, the rules work differently today on structural issues like the ones you're talking about than they did at the time. So that's uh, I just encourage viewers to really take on board what Julian was saying about these issues. Um, as far as uh, the concerns that Julian and David have raised about constitutional reform and how to get there in a convention and so on, um, these are very legitimate concerns. And I'll try and just quickly take them, you know, sort of one by one. Um, the first thing I want to say is I don't advocate a total replacement of the 1787 Constitution. There are things I like about a lot about it, and I don't think that any convention is at all likely to say, let's just throw it out. What the heck? Start over. You know? That's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. And part of the reason it's not going to happen is that I envision the convention process as a process with political safeguards, one of which is that if people want to go off and do crazy stuff, they might as well stay home because it isn't going to get ratified. One thing we know about the original Constitution is that the delegates wanted to make some changes that they did not make because they knew the Constitution would be rejected. And so they were well aware that they had to have the Constitution ratified. So there was a political safeguard you know, built in. There would be today. I don't think it makes any sense to set up a convention that doesn't require a popular supermajority to ratify its work. So first of all, I'll throw it all out. I don't think any convention will. Second of all, in terms of legitimating the convention's work, that's what the ratification process is all about. It's the same kind of debate that took place in 1787, where in every state, people get to start throwing rocks at whatever a convention comes up with, and they talk about what it's going to do and how it's going to work, and then they, they decide. And so that is a legitimating process, the process of debate. Uh, it's why Congress holds hearings on legislation. I don't just announce on Tuesday that on Wednesday they're going to pass a big bill because they try to legitimate their work. In the ratification process, I think, will do the same thing. Um, as to Julian's concern about hyper-politicization, which I think is a legitimate concern, there's a sense in which it's a council of despair, because if you say, look, we're really politically divided, so what's the point of having this conversation or trying to find a way to make it work, then we're quitting before we start because we think we're going to fail. And my view is that the convention is actually one of the few places that can overcome that process, because you can make a grand bargain where I get some of what I want, you get some of what you want, right? Nobody is entirely thrilled with the results, but the issues have been dealt with in a way that everybody recognizes is how we're going to move forward. This same process actually, Julian, happened, and I talk about this in my Confederation book, 
right before the 1787 convention, Congress was completely deadlocked in 1786, at the end of 1786, because half the country wanted to create a treaty with Spain that would benefit the heck out of New England and would destroy a good part of the South. And the South was like, we're not going to do this, you know. So these guys were unable to legislate about anything that mattered whatsoever. And if you wanted to see a politicized environment, all you had to do is to look at how these people felt about each other at the time. I mean, there are people from the North who could not have crossed the river and gone South in 1786 and 7, right? So I think hyper-politicization is something that happens from time to time. A convention is actually, I think, one of the best methods of overcoming that problem because we're going to choose delegates in a free and open uh, process. They're going to have a chance to decide what issues they really want to focus on because they can't focus on everything and because if they do, they'll lose anyway. Um, so I think we can get past that. Um, I think that um, uh, civic awareness and values debates that's what, exactly what I think the convention will do, is it'll force people not just to debate these issues in the abstract, but to say, well, if you really believe in voting rights, then you have to be willing to support these rules for who gets to vote and how they get to vote. And when a consensus forms around issues like that, um, it's powerful enough that it does reaffirm values, okay? When, if you think about the Constitution, and I'm sure many of our viewers know this, but and you guys certainly do, there was no Bill of Rights in the Constitution as it was originally proposed to the voters in 1787. There was no Bill of Rights. And the public was unhappy enough about this that that alone nearly defeated the original Constitution. And so once they got through by the skin of their teeth, they realized, we have to fix this. So there was a very extensive debate in Congress about the values behind the Bill of Rights. Madison lost on one of the main religious freedom issues that he was pushing, and it just died at that point because the values debate was pretty conclusive. And people said, we're putting this stuff into the Constitution. It's part of the values that we're going to support. So, um, you know, I think the convention process makes people nervous, but it has huge potential. George, can I push? Can I push back gently on this? By the way, sure. um, I think the demographic patterns that have that have characterized the last few decades have have, have led to. I, I think one of the beauties of the Constitution, federalism, is that. And, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong here. Moderates the fringe, by the way, in some ways. It, um, Washington has a way of moderating the fringe. At least it has, right? Um, but not as it stands now in, in relationship to Malibu, right? There's a small number of people who are making decisions for a larger number. Who's choosing the delegates is my ultimate question. Well, and how do well, we... That's fair. In, in, the, in the book, I talk a lot about how the delegates should be chosen because you're exactly right. If you choose them using the current rules, the game is over. That's right. You know, in a lot of ways, the game is over. Okay, so we're going to have to start out with the understanding that we have to choose delegates with a more democratic uh, system than the Constitution would normally dictate. I apologize, but our time for discussion uh, is up. Uh, and so we said we would take questions uh, from viewers, and I think it's now come that time. Okay, um, so here's a question uh, from a viewer. Uh, let me click on a second, read it. Would term limits and other administrative policies help address the issues related to racial and class inequality? So the question is term limits and racial and class inequality. Would one of the two of you like to take that? Oh, um, so whether uh, term limits is, is something, there, there are two um, issues that I, I think are always important. One, we want to talk about what's uh, constitutionally permissible, like what what you can do. And then the second part is having a discussion about whether we think a policy is a is a good or or bad idea. So we always want to start on the issue of what's constitutionally uh, permissible. And in our the way our system works now, that 
ultimately it, it becomes a determination of the majority of the nine people on the on the Supreme Court. My own uh, sense is that we want um, as many options to be things that we have debates about as people about whether we think they're a good or bad idea that we should test, that we should be experimental. My own um, kind of understanding of how term limits have worked, and this is at the, the state level, and I'm, I'm from uh, a small state, uh, Nevada, is it's been enormously difficult uh, to have continuity and to, to run the system, that so much of it is based on the kind of connections and knowledge. We have um, a system that uh, we meet every other year. So I, I think there are arguments both for and against uh, term limits. I'm not sure it's going to address uh, the uh, concerns that that Julian has, particularly if you have political parties that are really kind of running uh, the process. You're going to, I think, you know, continue to replicate uh, some patterns we've seen. But I'd be interested to, to hear uh, Julian's response. I agree. That's my response. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Um, There is a chain in the chat asking, why do we not enforce laws on the books before creating new ones? Um, so uh, if, if it's all right with you, um, I'd like to take that question. Sure. Okay. A lot of what we've been talking about here are structural problems that have nothing to do with enforcing the law. Nobody argues that the existing constitution says every state get two senators and that they have equal votes in the Senate. What we're saying is that's a huge problem. So on the one hand, I, as someone who was engaged in law enforcement uh, in, in part of my past career, um, I favor much stronger law enforcement than we have today. But unfortunately, it is not going to solve a lot of the core problems that have to do with a really weak uh, social safety net uh, and enormous uh, inequalities, both in wealth and in uh, the way the criminal justice system works. Enforcement will improve things marginally, but it's not going to get to the heart of our problems, is what I think. I'm waiting. Uh, here we go. Uh, apparently, we did such a good job that the audience doesn't have any further questions. Um, so I uh, uh, would like to uh, say that I, there we go. Um, if, if either of you all have some concluding remarks you'd like to offer, why don't we do that? And then I have a couple of things I'd like to add based on the discussion today. Yeah, if I may, I'll just uh, quickly on the last question about law enforcement. Sure. Say one of the really interesting things about uh, leading up to uh, the Constitution of 1787, you know, James Madison was enormously concerned uh, that states were passing too many laws; they weren't um, allowing people to know what they were. They were changing them. He had uh, enormous concerns about uh, this idea that you need predictability. Some stability in lawmaking. So the original constitution, you know, Madison's vision is, is not only uh, st strengthening how the federal government will go, but it was also an attempt to, to think about how um, we can create systems where uh, states operate better. But in terms of, um, you know, kind of closing remarks on the, of the conversation that we had. Let me, uh, yes. let me so, just uh, say, uh, stop you there for a moment. Sure. Yeah. Um, it turns out we got an additional question. Oh, sure. There's a, viewer, there's a viewer who would like to know what is a runaway convention? Um, and would either of you like to take a crack at that or shall I? Sure. I'm happy to just say um, what's interesting about the idea of a, a runaway convention uh, convention is that they're not going to follow, you know, kind of a, a preset uh, instructions that when you think about the original constitution, that they're, they're being sent there to just amend the Articles of Confederation, and then they pretty early on decide that that makes no sense, that we need a, a new system. So when people, I think, talk about a runaway um, convention, what they're afraid of is these people are going to do 
uh, there's no constraints, there are no limits, there are no safeguards. They're going to do something that we don't want. And part of what uh, George's um, argument is that the ultimate safeguard that protects us against, if you think a runaway convention is frightening, is if it requires supermajority support to ratify it, to make it the law of the land, that protects us from the fear that they're going to do something that we the people don't want. That's, when I hear runaway convention, I, I think people are concerned that uh, they're going to come up with something where suddenly there, there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of press. Uh, that it, that's, it's like the initial concern that why would I trust these people with so much power? Right. Julian, would you like to add to that? Or? Uh, no, you can go ahead, George. Okay. Um, let me just emphasize that this is a concern that lots of people have um, about runaway conventions. For example, the people who support a balanced budget amendment, um, and there are a number of states that are calling for a convention just limited to a balanced budget amendment. Right? They have tried to do handsprings to find ways to prevent that convention from considering anything else other than a balanced budget amendment. It's actually a crime in a couple of states for a delegate to a convention to consider the balanced budget amendment to agree to talk about anything else. That's how nervous people are about this. But I think they're kind of missing the point, and David, I think, really made it. It's legal safeguards aren't going to solve these kinds of problems. My book spends a lot of time talking about the legal issues, and you can read all that, but what I basically conclude is that this is a political process. And as a result, if you're happy with the political safeguards, the legal details are something you can leave somebody else to fight about in a court. Um, and so a runaway convention, which is it, it, absolutely the 1787 convention, was a runaway convention. And they knew it. And they knew that as a result, they had to come up with proposals that would gain ratification in the enough states to change the way things were being done. And, and part of their concern and part of Madison's concern actually was not that states were passing too many laws, although he did think that, but also that states were refusing to obey confederation treaties, not just laws, but treaties that the confederation had made with foreign governments. And Madison didn't think that better enforcement was gonna solve that problem. He thought a new government was needed to solve it. I think that's where we are on some pretty fundamental uh, concerns that people have. So um, I, I don't see any additional questions. So, gentlemen, uh, closing remarks. David was midstream, so I'll let him continue, by the way. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to close since I, I have an image of George Washington behind me. So part of the, the kind of magic and success of the original convention was that George Washington agreed to participate. Um, his prestige was enormously important. He presides over the convention, and it's part of that process of giving it uh, legitimacy. So what, I, what I'm interested in, and it's really you know a question for George and the viewers, is if we can imagine somebody, and it goes to Julian's concerns about how divided we are, um, if we can imagine a living American right now who could preside over a new constitutional convention where the vast majority of Americans would say that person is somebody I trust, I believe in, if he or she is putting um, their um, career, their legacy behind this. And I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining um, who would play that role say we did this in, in 2026. But that, that might be just um, going back to Julian's uh, point about path dependency, that if you think you can't change circumstances, then you tend to think you're in a better position than you are. So as part of this kind of imagining, you know, who plays that role, it's something I've been, I've been thinking about. And I should say to his credit, uh, in the book, George lists Americans who he thinks um, you, you don't need, um, you can't replace Washington with one. George has about 12 people who should be part of the process of saying we need to have a convention and raise 
the, the funds, but just kind of thinking on that point of, you know, are there people in the United States today that Americans can look at and say, these are people who um, I trust? So that, that, that's where I'll, I'll end my, my comments. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Julia. I would say, you know, and I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record here, that actions that don't seem political can have political implications. And these demographic um, shifts that, I'm, that I keep bringing up are, um, are some of the most profound demographic shifts that have happened in recent human history. They are, the world has become more urban. And the strategies that we devise to meet those types of challenges um, are going to require a political reimagination of epic proportions. Um, and I think we have to leave open the possibility um, that the ways that we are living our lives in the 21st century, and if these trends continue apace, they are going to demand um, that, we, that we think very intently about how we interact with one another in political spaces. Um, and we may not have a choice in the future um, if many of the more ominous trends uh, that, uh, are, that are on the horizon continue um, we might have to come to the table one way or the other to think very intently about our relationship to one another in the political arena. Okay. Um, I think with that, uh, what I, and thank you both very much for those comments um, and for participating. Um, I, I want to leave our viewers uh, with the following. Uh, the archives, if you haven't been there, the archives is a wonderful place. Um, and there are important things you can see there um, in addition to the uh, originals of the Constitution and the Articles of Confederation. <clears throat> and they include a really significant civil rights uh, exhibit that was put together between the archives and uh, uh, private contributors, uh, which I really would encourage uh, parents with school age kids uh, to visit if they uh, are able to go to the archives. So the archives is a great national institution. Um, and we, uh, I personally very much appreciate their willingness to host this and the talk on my previous book. Um, and I want to thank our viewers again um, for uh, their time today. And with that, I guess we'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.